Caught Me Talking, one of our favorite guests. There he is. <laughs> Mark Diano, Star Ledger columnist and author of a terrific new novel. It's called The Last Newspaper Man. How you doing? I'm doing good. Usually we have you on our other show, uh, Capital Report, mm -hmm. right? Talking about public policy, and we've been talking sure. about the storm. Storm. Um, we're doing the show. Murder uh, and mayhem. Murder, murder, mayhem. And, yeah. And by the way, a lot of things that people don't talk about. Mark, you can check out his stuff on NJ.com as well as in the Star Ledger. But this book, we promised you for a while we were wanting to have you uh, that we'd have you on to talk about this book. Uh, it's a novel set in the 1930s in New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it about tabloid journalism? Well, when, when did it start, by the way? Th Last week. This is this is the, the <laughs> you know it's not a historic novel. It's, it's a piece of modern contemporary fiction that draws attention to something that I think is a problem, and that is a, a tabloid journalism mentality that has in, encroached into almost all media. And by the way, you know it a little bit because you used to work at the, the New Post. York Post yeah, as a sports columnist, and yes. uh, and so I, you know, saw it with my own two eyes at a time that point in my life. And um, just to, to tell you, I was a sports writer in those days, and I made a very conscious decision to get out of sports because I saw that it was becoming more of a celebrity and entertainment entity. And I wanted to come back to New Jersey and do more authentic type of journalism. And I made that decision at 33 years old, and I, I've never regretted that. Uh, but the novel is about the inception of the, um, the crime and celebrity infatuation that we have in modern media today. And it traces back to the 1920s and the 1930s. And it was so immensely profitable that it really seeped into the media culture that we have today. And Mark, let's put into context that period of time, right? Talk about the 1930s, the kind of tabloid stories that would people would have a field day today with the internet, right? 24-7 mm -hmm. news cycle. The Lindbergh baby kidnapping. Mm -hmm. The Hindenburg crash. The war of the world's radio cast. Right. War of the Worlds, the first story to ever go viral. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in context so that people know how. Talk about the Manti Teo hoax. Right. Put that into context. Talk about a hoax. That is, uh, th it is really the first story to go viral. And of course, the analogy <laughs> is it's a new technology. Right. It's radio, not the internet. But in, the, in 19, um, the, the broadcast, whatever year it was, I can't remember right now, um, it created a hysteria to some degree. It was a case of media covering media, and so it wasn't. It was sort of like the social network stories we do today. Something becomes a story because it trends on Twitter, and 50,000 people care. Well, 330 million people don't, <laughs> but still, it becomes a big story. And War of the Worlds was kind of like that. The uh, the idea that it set off this national hysteria and panic was frankly baloney. Should we let people know that it actually wasn't a real story? And and people, a lot of people thought that it was real. But many, many, many people did not, and and especially the people in Grover's Mills, because they could look out the window and they they knew the Martians weren't there. They they and knew, that was the broadcast. And that was the that broadcast. the Martians were coming. Yeah, yeah, and they landed in Grover's Mills, New Jersey. <laughs> but what, what is it about New Jersey and these kind of stories, by the way? Well, you know, the, the novel's set in New Jersey. The novel's all set in New Jersey. There's three things I know. I know, I know newspaper work. I know New Jersey, and in the book, uh, my main character makes this horrible miscalculation. Is this Fred Haynes? Fred Haynes. Yeah. He makes this horrible miscalculation and he loses the woman that he loves in this, this miscalculation. And so the three things I know, I know newspapers, I, knew, I know New Jersey, and I know that I don't know anything about women. You do not. So, so, so those are the three things that kind of You know come. something about kids. <laughs> yeah. Well. I always ask you every show, how many? Six. Six. Yeah. The book centers on those, th those things. And what the book really is, just to set it up, it's like the movie Little Big Man. It's a young reporter interviewing an old guy in 1999. He stumbles upon this guy. He's doing one of those turn-of-the-century stories. And he meets a guy who was a tabloid reporter in the 1930s. And as the guy begins to tell him these stories, it's the young reporter who makes the bridge between those times and the media as it exists today. He then understands, you're the guy that started it all. You're one of the guys that started this all, this sort of what I feel is a cheapening of the free press and a, a bottom denominator approach to the news. You turn on the television, murder, 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 murder. Celebrity. Murder. Yeah, celebrity stories, murder. What bothers crime. you about that? 
Uh, if what bothers me about that as a journalist is there are so many great authentic stories that get left on the cutting room floor or, or on the table. The, the, it's, it's lazy journalism. Crime is lazy journalism. You know, somebody gets shot, somebody gets murdered, and you, know, you go out and you do a story and, and then we have to follow it and we have to get into the head of the killer or find out the family Why problems. is that lazy? Well, because it, it's, 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 not, it's not really, uh, it's no longer an anomaly. It's not, to me, it's not really news. News is, news is the stuff that's more important. What, what, the, what the state is doing, what the government's doing, how your money's being spent, the big issues. You know, um, Mante Teo, the linebacker kid. From Notre Dame. The Notre Dame kid. At the very same time that story is playing, there's a hostage situation in the Middle East that may have involved Americans nobody knows about. Why? Because this kid's dumbbell story dominates the, the media. And that's lazy. It's very lazy. It's very lazy. What price do we pay? Well, we become uninformed, and I think uh, we become <laughs> stupider as a nation. Yeah, but Mark, here's the, here's the irony, or the paradox. There are more information platforms, I was going to say news right, sources, right. but more information platforms, more places where you can get information on the internet instantaneously right. than ever before. How could we be stupider, your word? I think that the mainstream... Less informed. It's the mainstream, it's the mainstream that, you know, when you flip to the networks and you go to the news stations, it's that uh, broadcast media. You do something very different than those guys, okay? So I can find you, but if I'm flipping the channels on any given night at six o'clock, I'm getting the same stories over again. This fire, this killing, this bad news. I have to tell you something. I think at some point it, the, the society becomes reflective itself of what they're being told they are. You know, we talked about, uh, I, I've, I think I've told you this story before, maybe not on the air, but off the air. I was doing a I was doing a class for my third grade kids, you know, some community servicing the giraffe program. I asked the kids, how many, how many of you think there's more bad people in the world than good people? Half the class raised their hand. That's on more us. More bad people. Yeah, that's on us. That's on the media. That's on the presentation, in our media and our entertainment of, what do you see? You see murder. You see crime. You see shoot 'em ups. You know, you know, Django Unchained is released on Christmas Day. Nobody says a peep. Three hundred murders. Greatest cowboy ever, movie ever made, High Noon. You know how many murders are in that one? One. You know, and, and so we have this complete, in my view, a desensitizing of human life. But, 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 and we contribute to that. I don't disagree with anything you're saying. But with the novel, is your objective to point it out through the story of this younger um, guy, mm -hmm. Haynes, and this older guy who was there in the 1930s, right? right at the beginning, which people don't realize that's when it, a lot sure. of it started. A lot of it started. Are you looking to say time out? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, this is what, one of the things, I, I do a lot of talks about the book, and people say, well, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. This is the stuff that sells. And I say, well, if this is the stuff that sells, why are people running away from the news in droves? They're not buying as many papers. They're not going to online sites the way the, the online people thought they were. Television news ratings are down. Clearly, we have done something as an industry to alienate people from, from the product. You and say you think want most, excuse me, you saying you think most people want something different than what we're feeding them? I absolutely think that. And Steve, you know as well as I do, <laughs> when we were young in the business, people would say to you, oh, I never watch the news. It's all bad. Now they say, I don't watch the news. It's all bad and it's all biased. So the political... Right. Polarization That's what's different. Has, has snuck in in, in our In the our, age our of careers. MSNBC and Fox, right. I can predict where they're coming from. Right. That is different. That is different. But I think that sense of the news being depressing and bad and not finding stories of great substance and meaning and great of human, <clears throat> human dimension, I think is, is a big strike. And I think we've created that ourselves. In the spirit of trying to find a cliche, I know, silver lining in terms of what we could potentially do other than do this. Mm -hmm. I, don't know any, I don't know any other way other than to try to raise corporate and foundation money and do this. Right, right, right. And bring it right. to an audience through our public television friends mm -hmm. at WNET and, and JTV and all the other places that are, we're lucky enough to have carry us. What else can we do? 
Well, you know, I think there's there has to be, uh, you know, the media is one of the, journalism as a profession is one of the few professions that doesn't have guidelines. There's no national boards. There's no, there's no, you know, we don't have to meet any criteria. What about you know, the FCC? You get it. Well, I'm saying like, you know, from an individual journalist, right, okay. you get a video camera, you're a journalist. You right. get a microphone, you're a journalist. And I think that um, there has to be some kind of self-awareness within the industry and teach people in the industry that, you know, there's a lot more than blood and guts. And sometimes you have to discipline yourself to, to step away from that, you know. When I was an editor at the Star Ledger and um, in charge of all the bureaus, you know, we could have written a, there was a homicide every couple of days. After a while, it, it, it's deadening, you know, and the victims are only characters in a newspaper story. Um, you, you, we don't see the funerals, we don't see the grief, we just see the crime. You know, we see the yellow police tape, we see the latest dead guy. We, we don't follow that, we don't get the depth of humanity, and, and, it, and it really becomes you know, just too much of ladling this bad news onto people. I got a few seconds left. Are you optimistic that we can begin to turn it around? I'm optimistic in that I think the country's a lot smarter than the media gives it credit for. And I think that's one of the things when you alluded to this greater platform of information, people can and they are choosing to go to other places for information. And I think that hopefully mainstream media and mainstream papers will get that at some point. One of the other things you do is go out and uh, get Mark's novel, The Last Newspaper Man, and it will not be the last time you join us. Mark, not only for one-on-one, -on -one, but on Capitol Report, you'll continue talking about what's going on uh, after uh, Hurricane Sandy down the Jersey Shore, particularly in those communities that don't get a lot of attention. Mark, thank you, and congratulations on the book. We thank still you. have work to do. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. One-on-one -on -one will continue right after this. Thank you, Mark. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Fedway Associates, Inc., New Jersey State Nurses Association, PSE&G committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. The law firm of Gibbons PC. And by St. Peter's University, the Jesuit University of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.